Well, good morning, students. Good to be with you again. This is now our final session of uh, Paul and his letters. I hope you've enjoyed the course so far. You've learned a lot. I certainly have. It's been a, a great blessing to, to study in Paul's letters and learn great doctrine and great application of doctrine over these weeks and months. And, um, well, we, we come to our last session, and that will be in 2 Thessalonians. But um, uh, I'll, and I'll come back to how we're going to go through that. But before we do that, I'd like to read in chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, and then we'll pray and continue with our class. Let's read now from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to start verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God consider, considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel, of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might, when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have, have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end we always pray for you, that our God may make your, you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in that, just that opening chapter of one of two Thessalonians we find the the thanksgiving of Paul for the life of these Thessalonians the faith and the love and the steadfastness even within persecution and we see his speaking about the return of Christ and the judgment of unbelievers and the um, the reward of or the um, relief of those who believe and trust in him. So we're going to look at, especially at the theme of Christ's return today. But before we go any further, let's pray. Holy God, our Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who has come for the work of our salvation and will come again to bring us to yourself for eternity and to bring final judgment. Lord, we look forward to that day. And Lord, thank you for your word that comes to us today. And we ask that you'd give us greater understanding, that we may live lives that will bring glory to you. And we look forward to that as we see, even in this prayer, that you would be the one who gives us power to, to do good and to, to do works of faith for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, if you can turn in your study guide to page 102, we had done 
the, um, the overview of 1 and 2 Thessalonians last week, as well as the overview of the content of 1 Thessalonians. So today we look at uh, 2 Thessalonians, and then we look at the theological issue of the return of Christ to close off. Um, so let's um, begin looking there on page 102 at the overview of 2 Thessalonians. Um, just to remind you that 1 Thessalonians had basically two sections. The first dealt with the past and the second the future. One was more about practical things. The, the, the second was more about doctrinal things. And uh, faith, love, steadfastness and holiness were major uh, terms and, and themes in 1 Thessalonians. And those continue to a degree in 2 Thessalonians. Um, but the emphasis on the eschatology of Paul is the key thing for us to uh, think about even as we continue today. The things that will happen at the return of Christ. So in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13, in 1 Thessalonians 4 from verse 13 all the way to chapter 5 verse 11, was about eschatology and even other verses in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians refer to the return of Christ. Um, but uh, today we're looking at the content of the second letter to the Thessalonians and we're looking at Paul's eschatology. Um, remember in 1 Thessalonians there were two aspects to the eschatology and the um, references to the return of Christ. One was in, at the end of chapter 4 that the return of Christ and the resurrection is a, is a means of comfort for those who are grieving those who have already died. So, um, and that, there also we saw that the emphasis was on that there is only one return of Christ, not more than one. And then in chapter 5, the resurrection and the return are for our zeal, for serving God, and for a holy life. So one is for comfort, and one is for zeal. All right, so let's continue looking at uh, the second letter to the Thessalonians. So the second letter is a response to the manner in which the first letter was received, and to a degree misunderstood by the Thessalonians. Um, there was a, a sense in which the theology of the letter had led them to uh, become lazy, some of them anyway, and they were not working. And so Paul is wanting to correct their misunderstanding. And if we compare 1 and 2 Thessalonians, we see that there are some recurring patterns. Uh, the second letter still emphasizes faith, love, and steadfastness. Um, then there's also this pattern that we saw before of prayer interchanged with discussion of practical or doctrinal issues. So it was prayer, prayer, prayer along the way and in between the, either practical issues or, or doctrine. Then again there's eschatology as a main concern, um, especially its influence on the life that we live now in the present. Um, 2 Thessalonians can be divided into three main parts and again like we saw more or less in, in 1 Thessalonians each main part starts with a prayer. So part 1 is quite a nice helpful diagram at the bottom of the page for you um, but part 1 is the endurance in the faith in connection to persecution and the judgment of God. And that is up chapter 1 from verse 3 up to verse 10. Um, so although they face persecution for their faith, um, they should not become disheartened because God will judge their, their enemies at the coming of Christ. So summing it up even as it is in the diagram, chapter 1 verses 3 to 10 is about endurance in persecution. It, it begins with a prayer of thanksgiving for their faith, love, and steadfastness. And then it looks to the return of Christ 
and the judgment of their enemies. Then part two is a warning against being misled. That's um, from chapter 1 verse 11 to chapter 2 verse 12. Um, some had been convinced that Christ had already returned. That was the problem that Paul wanted to address. So he shows that before Christ returns, there will first appear a figure um, who is actually the man of lawlessness as the final enemy of God. So that's part two. It's a warning against being misled. And again, that begins with a prayer um, that they would be worthy of, of the calling um, that God has put on them. And that would bring glory to God. And then it goes back again to the return of Christ and this man of lawlessness. And then in part three, that's about the life in accordance with the gospel. And that we've seen again and again as we've looked at the epistles. The idea that here's the gospel, the true gospel, now live accordingly. I mean, 1 Thessalonians, it, it meant a holy life. Um, so here it will be addressed again in chapter 2, verse 13, up to chapter 3, verse 15. And the way that they need to, to live in accord with the gospel in this case is that they should not live lazy lives, but they should work hard. So um, again, there's a prayer of thanksgiving uh, that starts off that section. And thanksgiving that they have been chosen through the gospel, the true gospel, and then it goes again to the return of Christ and the work that needs to be done in the present. Um, the diagram also shows you that at the beginning of the letter there's a, there's a salutation and at the end there's a blessing, which is um, quite standard for Paul's letters. Alright, so the salutation, uh, verses, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, um, basically again we find, as we read, that Paul and Silas, or Silvanus, and Timothy are the co-authors, but um, Paul is the primary author, and um, that's the same as 1 Thessalonians. And again, the, the recipients are the believers in the city of Thessalonica. Okay, now the first uh, main part is the issue of endurance in persecution, chapter 1, verses 3 to 10 as we read. So the letter opens with a prayer of the testimony of these believers in verses 3 and 4. And um, Paul is giving thanks to God for their faith and their love. And, and, and the fact that their faith and love grew in a hostile environment. And that um, was because they were persecuted for Christ and the gospel. But being persecuted, they remained faithful, they remained steadfast in their faith. And so Paul is, is commending them and giving thanks for their testimony of faith and love in the face of persecution. And you see, the problem with persecution is that it can sometimes get to the point where person, a believer is broken. A believer's uh, spirit is broken. So Paul wants to encourage the believers by bringing persecution, that's the reality of persecution, into connection with the fact that Christ is coming back. And that day of Christ will sort out all that persecution means. So they need to be kept in relation. When we face difficulties, when we face persecution, we need to keep that in the perspective of the return of Christ. So what you find in your notes on page 104 is that there are three um, motivations, basically, motivations for endurance of persecution. And that relating to what's here in chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians. The first thing is that um, these believers have already been granted citizenship in the kingdom of God. Verse 5, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. So the fact that the believers are suffering for the sake of Christ 
is evidence that they no longer belong to the world. You are persecuted. As, as Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. So being persecuted be, for the sake of Christ is evidence that you belong to the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. So that's the first point um, in motivation to endure persecution. Secondly, um, the persecutors themselves will be judged by God when Christ returns. So in verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal dis destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Those are very, very serious words. Strong language used for what will happen to those who are not believers. And in fact, especially those who are persecutors of the church, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. That's terrible. And we must remember that and pray. Pray for our persecutors. Pray for unbelievers. That that would not be their destiny. And the, the context of this is the background of the society of honor and shame. So when they are being persecuted, they are being dishonored. Okay? They are being shamed in their society for the sake of Christ, who is their benefactor, because their society sees their benefactor as somebody of no real reputation. But in fact, what is going to happen is that when Christ does return, he will turn their shame into glory and those who were shaming them will now be the ones who are shamed that's what's going on in all of that okay so you are citizens the first point you're motivated to endure persecution because you are citizens of god's kingdom secondly because you know that those who are persecuting you will have to have to face god's judgment and that judgment will be severe and you will be uh, you will be glorified when they are shamed. And then thirdly, your persecution will come to an end. And that's what we always have to keep in mind. It's hard and we have to endure, but it will come to an end. Verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 1 says, And that Christ will grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Relief. Okay, believers can endure the persecution because they have set their sight on Christ and the end of the spiritual race. As Paul said, I have run the race, I fought the fight, um, I've kept the faith, and now he knows there's a crown of righteousness waiting for him. So we too can do that. We can run the race knowing it will come to an end. All right, so that's the first part. The second part of the content of 2 Thessalonians is um, warnings against being misled. Chapter 1, verse 11, all the way to chapter 2, verse 12. So again, it starts with the prayer, which we also already read. Um, and Paul prays for the believers that God may make them worthy of uh, their calling and or God's calling upon their lives. Basically, that they may have strength to live a life of love in accordance with the gospel by the power of God, even when they are persecuted. And then this prayer leads to the discussion of the return of Christ and the appearance of the man of lawlessness. What will be the signs of Christ's coming is basically what um, 2, Thess 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-12 is all about the signs of Christ's coming. So some had taught them that Christ had already returned, and some other they had missed it. Um, and look at uh, verses one and two there. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So Paul says, 
No, no. Before the coming of the Lord, another figure must first appear, the man of lawlessness. And so in verses 3 and 4 and verse 9 of chapter 2, we have a portrait of this man of lawlessness. And there are five things that you can see about him in these verses. Um, five characteristics of the man of lawlessness. Number one, he is in rebellion against the law of God. Um, let's read those verses. Um, chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God and or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And then verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. Alright, so um, firstly he is in rebellion against the law of God. He is an anti-law man, a man who will not accept or respect the law of God. Okay, he is the personification of lawlessness. Rebellion against the, the right of God to rule over his creation, over his people, over all people. And wanting to, to, to lead others to do the same. So he is in rebellion against the law of God. Secondly, he is destined to destruction. And we remember we saw already in chapter 1 verse 9 that those persecutors, those unbelievers are also destined to destruction, eternal destruction, which is hell. So this man of lawlessness, his destiny is fixed and his destination already determined by God. He's a doomed man before he's even set foot in this world. Um, we can compare that to Judas Iscariot, who um, was basically, um, he's described as, let me read um, in Matthew 26, verse 24, Matthew 26, verse 24, says this and jesus says the son of man goes as it is written of him but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it would have been better for that man if he had not been born and john 17 verse 12 makes it very clear it says um describes judas as while i was with them i kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. What a terrible description to be called the son of destruction. Well, the man of lawlessness is also, in a sense, a son of destruction. That is his destiny before he's even born. All right, the third thing about the man of lawlessness is that he is opposed to all types of worship um, in verse 4 who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god or object of worship you see he's not only opposed to true worship of the true god of the living god but he's even opposed to any kind of religious worship of any god false gods the only worship that he will allow is the worship of himself which is the fourth point that he will proclaim himself to be God and blaspheme against God by trying to take his place last the last characteristic of this man of lawlessness is that he will be able to perform miracles signs the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan and all power and false signs and wonders so he will mislead many by these signs and wonders. So, in rebellion against God's law, 
destined for destruction, is a doomed man, is opposed to all types of worship except worship of himself, and he is able to perform powerful miracles by the power of Satan. So, this man of lawlessness may make us become fearful, but at, actually at the coming of Christ, he will defeat the man of lawlessness. It says in chapter 2 there, verse 8, with the breath of his mouth, and um, he will, sorry, let me just read that properly. Chapter 2, chapter 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, And it says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So he's not someone to be feared. Christ will have no problem dealing with him when he comes, but it will only be when he comes. So this man of lawlessness must arise at some point before Christ comes. So if he hasn't appeared yet, then we can be sure that Christ also has not yet returned. And that's what the Thessalonians need to have clear, because they were confused about when Christ was going to be coming. Then um, the next section, the next part, yeah, chapter 2, verse 13, up to chapter 3, verse 15, is the life in accordance with the gospel. So, again, Paul starts this section with a prayer, and he gives thanks to God for these believers in Thessalon Thessalonica. And he thanks God because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Paul is thinking about these believers and the things that they are enduring and will still endure. And in his heart, he is glad and he is full of thanksgiving. They are a blessing to him, basically. He knows if it wasn't for God's grace and his love, they would still be dead in their sins and far from God in their trespasses. But they have been saved by the Lord. They've been chosen by the Lord. And, and they are able to stand firm as believers and live a life of love and faith because they are loved by the Lord. He has saved them by the blood of Christ. And his spirit is at work in them, sanctifying them. And they will be, well, they have been raised to new life in Christ. So how did this happen? Well, it came by the word of God, the word of truth. And so Paul says, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. Don't listen to these false prophets and their teachings. He reminds them. Paul rather says, listen to the true gospel. And he reminds them of the true gospel. And then he continues in chapter 3 from verses 1 to 5, asking the believers to pray for them. And there's two things that he asks them to pray for. One is that the, the gospel may spread rapidly. And that they, the second thing is that they may be delivered from evil men. So Paul himself is still having to face persecution as the Thessalonians are themselves then in the last part of the letter he addresses this issue of laziness it is in chapter 3 verse 11 for we hear that some among you walk in idleness not busy at work but busy bodies so he does this by commanding them how does he address this issue he commands them to keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. And he, and he says that they must warn any brother who's being idle. Um, and uh, he commends them themselves and asks them not to grow weary from doing good. Remember in chapter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 or chapter 2, it spoke about Paul's own example of being diligent, even working night and day, so that he would not be a burden upon them. So that's their example, not being lazy. And that's the example that they need to follow. Then he closes with the blessing, 
of peace and grace, which is common in his letters. And he also mentions his signature, basically, in verse 17. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. And that remark we've seen before in 1, Thessalon uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 21. But the fact that he, he says, this is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine, um, is, is, is making sure that they, they, they're getting this, that this is him speaking to them. Because remember, there's been mention of a letter in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that there was a letter seeming to be from Paul and Timothy and uh, Silas, or Silvanus. So it seems that Paul's making sure they notice that this is his signature at the end. That signature presumably was also at the end of 1 Thessalonians, but he's emphasizing it now to make sure that they know and they're not going to be shaken by a letter that comes from someone else. So there's been people apparently sending letters using Paul's name or one of the other co-workers' names in order to basically try to infiltrate this congregation and confuse them with false doctrines, such as the, the doctrine that Christ has already come. All right, so there's, uh, we've covered the uh, overview, a very quick overview of the content of 2 Thessalonians. So what we're going to do in a few minutes is look at the whole eschatology of not just 2 Thessalonians, but also 1 and 2 Thessalonians together and fit it into the whole, um, a whole biblical eschatology. But first we'll, we'll take a short break.